scripture reading of God's Word today is in Luke 6, 46-49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house and could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Good morning. morning. It's good to be back. Thank you for missing us. That makes us feel very special. Let's start with prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful weather, this beautiful place we live, the freedoms that we have. Lord, we just thank you for all the good things, even in a fallen world. And Lord, help us to build our lives wisely on the foundation of Jesus Christ, to boldly go out and tell others through the power of the Spirit of the love that we have in Christ Jesus, the eternal home that is being prepared for us, the peace that we have that surpasses all understanding, the joy that we have with one another. And Lord, may we be here to strengthen one another, may we be here to comfort each other, and we just thank you for this family that you have given us. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I guess I don't need to dismiss children's church. They've gone. (laughs) Isn't it nice to hear the laughter and stuff? But Barry wouldn't trade with me. And mine was getting kind of rough. Yours was a blessing. (laughs) I don't know what mine weighs. I think she's doubled in weight when we were gone. Because she just seemed so much bigger. Sherry, when we saw her last night, well... We expected to come in and, Nana, Nana, or Pa, and she just walked right by us. <laughs> like that, I mean, she was just like that, and then walked, and then she wanted to show us stuff, but she didn't say nothing. And then Sherry's like, oh, she's grown up while we're gone. <laughs> and Michaela's like, she hasn't changed any. Her expressions have, and she's just bigger. It's just amazing what you, what you think anyway, and, and Isaac is... Twice, twice as big it seems like. So we were blessed to get to go. It was a wonderful time, especially to go see all of the military establishments and the history and everything there. And I told John, and, and that's true to anybody who has served and is serving, thank you so much. And I can't hardly say it without getting choked up. Thank you. So anyway, I entitled this message, Solid Foundation for Life. Polly, cat out of the bag last week, said that she had read the sermon already because I sent it to her to give her some ideas and stuff. But I'm old, I forget. Oh, okay. But she's already forgot about it because she's old. (laughs) And I have to say this. I've already told her this. Her difference in her... um, confidence level up here drawing on the spirit was amazing and she may not have spent a massive amount of time but that's okay the points she said came from her heart they were deep and meaningful and thank you for doing that solid foundation for life and we're going to talk a little bit more about the scripture that we read in Luke 6 46 to 49 if you're studying in Corinthians you know that that Paul writes about the foundation the only foundation is Jesus Christ you can build upon it you know in different ways and everything by the powers of the spirit that are upon you and you need to know what your gifts are as Paul said and use them don't waste your life use them wisely Jesus died so that he could spend so he could send the spirit back so that we could do greater works than He did when He was here. And I told you to read that verse and read that chapter and and contemplate on that. When we flew out for Hawaii, I heard somebody talking about don't fly southwest. And I had no idea what they're talking about. Maybe some, some of you know and some of you don't know, and I'll get to that in a little bit. 
I didn't think anything about it. I figured they just had a bad experience. But a tragedy happened on Southwest about a week ago. And Sherry had me pray for our flight before we left. And I'm like, well, I'll pray for safe time and stuff. She said, no, 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 pray for the fact that we get a row by ourselves. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can do that. But, but I want to thank God for all the blessings and everything first. But then I want to say, Daddy, you know, you can really bless us further by having a safe trip out there because it's a long trip. And she has some medicine for her restless legs, and I do too. It's tough flying, being cramped up. And we, we went to get that medicine. They had closed like 15 minutes earlier, so we didn't have the medicine to, to go. So I pray, you know, Daddy, please. We get to the airport and get on our first flight, and we got a row by ourselves. Yes, thank you, Father. Thank you for these blessings. And we made sure that we, we you know, thanked Him for that. On the plane from San Francisco to Hawaii... We were surprised again. We had an exit row. Anybody ever had an exit row? I mean, you can stretch your legs all the way out on an exit row, and you're looking around at all these other people saying, hmm, look what I've got. But it made me think, look what I do have. Look at the blessings that are through, from the Father through the Son to us. And that we would be called children of God. And that He would bless us by providing His Spirit to reside inside of us. And I thought, grace, grace, God's grace. How great it is in everything. So we simply rested on that row and rested in God's grace saying, oh, this is nice. Now there were some problems with it. We had a person sitting beside of us then. No big deal. But we didn't have a row to ourselves. And those chairs don't recline back, if you know that, on the emergency row. So you, you have to sacrifice there a little bit. But then you look at the leg room and you're like, ah, this is great. This is wonderful. And we think about our duty for being on that row. For what's been given to us. As Peter Parker's, let's see, would it be his, not his, I'm drawing a blank. Not, what's the opposite of aunt? Uncle. There we go. As Peter Parker's uncle said to him, with great power comes great responsibility. It's not a Bible verse, but it's got some truth there to it. Because, see, we've been given the power of God to be His witnesses, to proclaim the gospel message, to carry out the Great Commission, to train up disciples and spread the gospel message, to tell them of the love of God through Jesus Christ. Well, we had a responsibility on that road. We're supposed to help people if it was needed that there was an emergency or anything. And you always think, that's never going to happen to me. So you tune out what the stewardess or, or steward, or flight attendant, whatever you want to say, says, don't you? As soon as they start their speech, you immediately go into no zone. I've seen that sometimes here, trust me. And I understand that. I've been on the other side as well. But we immediately think, this isn't going to happen to me. It's not going to happen today. I've got all the time in the world. But do we? Do we know, were we there when God planted the stars in the sky? And do we know that His plans and the day that Christ will come back? We have no clue. But we have been given great power and great responsibility. We have a job to do. We are ambassadors living in a foreign land, carrying out a mission of telling others of Jesus Christ. But I looked around and no one was paying any attention. They were zoned off in their books or their media or already asleep or whatever. And the safety message was going on while nobody had a care in the world. And I thought, isn't that this world today? As in the days of Noah, we were eating and drinking and being merry. But Jesus will come in the twinkling of an eye, whether you're ready or not. Whether you accomplish the things that He set forth for you to do or not. Whether you die <coughs> or you're changed, transformed. We have but one life to live. And I'm thinking about all this and still not paying any attention to what, what she's having to say. But she's telling me the things that will help save my life. But not only save my life, but save others. So I should be paying her attention. And what is she thinking? She's up there going on thinking, nobody's listening to me. Why am I doing this? Except that I've got a job. A job that I have been given, a responsibility to tell these people. Because there may come an incident where they need to know this training. And if you know what happened on the Southwest flight, that's exactly what happened. 
We had our first U.S. casualty in an airline flight in I don't know how many years. We're a woman, a mother, got on a plane to go from here to there, and one of the engines had a problem, blew out the window of the plane at 30,000 feet. She was sucked into the window and it killed her. We do not have a clue when our time is up. We are given so many opportunities every day to tell others about Jesus Christ. And not only do we have those opportunities, but it is what Jesus called us to do. Pauli said it, Jesus began His works, and then He left them for us to continue as His hands and feet. feet. And then He empowered us to get that job done. What a glorious, glorious opportunity that we have. What a privilege, what an honor to be called children of God and to live it out. <clears throat> so how do you think that flight attendant did feel? But she kept on, didn't she? She kept on because she was responsible to her employer. She also had a responsibility to each one of us to tell us the things that could protect us, to save our, actually save our lives. And maybe, just maybe, in the case of emergency, maybe lives would be saved. So you've heard of the Great Commission. You know what it is. You know that it's that you're calling. Are you living it? You also know that there's a world out there all around us that needs saving. They need to know about Jesus Christ. They need to know about the hope that you have. For the joy that you have, right? Not just but the joy that you have. That you are the light of the world. That others may see the good works that you have and it may glorify your Father in heaven. And that they may ask you of the hope that's in you and you be prepared to give that. So wherever it's at in the grocery store, if it's on the plane, or wherever it's at, tell others about Jesus Christ, about that joy that you have. The new life that's been given to you. Because you've been given so much more than extra leg room. You've been given eternal life. You've been given the Spirit of God, the power to carry you through any tragedy, heartache, any high, any low, to prepare you fully, to equip you fully for spiritual battle and for this great commission. You have no excuse whatsoever. If you think you have an excuse, you're saying, God, your power is not good enough in my life. If you say, you can't use me, you're saying, God, you can't use somebody like me. Look, start reading the Bible from cover to cover. You'll see plenty of people that felt that way. And you'll say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. Because that's what you'll see out of weakness. You'll see God's power and His strength. So if you have new life, why in the world wouldn't you tell about others about it, that life? Because it could save their very soul for all eternity. So if tragedy does happen and their life is cut short, or that day comes when Jesus comes, they will be prepared. They will be made right with God so that they can spend eternity in heaven. So do you understand the commission that Jesus has given you? He gave it to all who believed, who said they would come and follow after Him. Have you said you'll follow after Him? Or did you just say, well, I, I believe because I, I want to go to heaven. Do you believe? Do you put your faith, your hope, and trust in Jesus Christ? Do you worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, and with His strength? Because your strength, your weakness is His strength. He lives through you. That's why you can get up with confidence once you rely on God. And say, let me get these distractions and other things out of the way. I am a vessel. Use me, Lord. And He will. And then you'll start experiencing things that you never experienced before. You'll see the beauty in this life. As long as you will be obedient, be a servant. Back to 1 Corinthians, they were arguing and complaining about things. Who was a better teacher and everything else? There were divisions in the church. And Paul said, who is Apollos? Who, who am I? Who is Peter? We're all servants because we have been given a task. We lay down our life to follow Jesus. And His sheep listen to His voice and only His voice. <clears throat> so do you understand your commission? And are you willing to do it? 
In Luke 12, and we've gone over this before, in verse 45 through 47, you read this. These are Jesus' words. But suppose the servant, just like Paul said, we are only servants. And as you read this, you're like, wait a minute, what is this servant? Because you'll find out from reading this, if you think the way I think and you agree with this, that this servant was a servant by name, but not by heart. They didn't take their job fully. They didn't embrace what they thought they believed. They didn't live a life that showed this. So when the day comes, were they truly saved? But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. Can't happen today. No crisis is going to happen today. Lord's not going to come back today. I will serve you, Lord, tomorrow when I get these things done. When I'm better equipped. When these things are out of the way. Whatever they are. My master taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to do the opposite of the task given to him. He begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. I don't get drunk. I know that. I hope that. But the thing is, is what are you consumed by? Scripture tells you not to get drunk with wine, but to get drunk off the Spirit. Not to be intoxicated by the things of this world, but to literally be intoxicated by the Spirit of God, where He's controlling you, directing you, where you're filled with... You, do, you can't even determine what you're going to do because you're high on Jesus. Of all things. Verse 46. The master, Jesus, of that servant. Don't put your name in this one. Because you'll find out that this one's false. This is the false flight attendant or the false servant. Will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware. And he will cut him to pieces. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy who thought he was a servant, but did not do the work. Who built his house on a false, sandy foundation. And he will assign him a place with the unbelievers. That's where you know that servant wasn't who, what he said he was. He worked right beside the other servants. He was your neighbor, your friend, your fellow co-worker, your fellow person at church. Who said, I believe... And we can recognize them by their fruits. We, we can look at that. And we're not here to judge by any means. But your life shows your belief. It, it does in, in things of this world and it especially does in your faith. Because if you really believe this, then you'll know the task that's set before you. You'll know that you have a responsibility. Your love will show. Your acts will show. And as you grow and mature, you'll start drinking more and more and more of the Holy Spirit to where you become intoxicated and high on Jesus. Verse 47. The servant, the true servant, the one who gets up there and reads those safety requirements every single day because she knows, he knows that it's their job, that it will save lives. That servant who knows the master's will and does... Excuse me, I'm in the wrong one. I'm ahead of myself. See, I can mess up too. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. Okay, this is a true servant, but they're not doing what the master does. They're going to get salvation, and I'm not going to get caught up on what this many blows is because I don't want to find out about it. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant instead. I want to hear, son, I'm proud of you. That's what I want to hear. You don't want to get caught off guard that day, whatever that day is. You want to live a life that brings worth, that brings glory and honor to God. You've been given an abundance of legroom. <clears throat> Do you believe what the, that the Bible is God's Word? Do you believe all of it, even the love your enemy part since you spoke up? Because I know Merle and I talk about that one's tough. Or do you want to pick and choose? Because see, this is all God's Word, all written for your instruction, a love letter from your Father in heaven. 
written in red, not the red words in here, but Jesus' blood. And it's His righteousness that makes you justified before God. And then He left this earth and said, Greater things you will do. You will be my witnesses if you truly believe. If the power of God resides inside of you. Are you willing to follow? Do you love Jesus because He first loved you and gave His life for you? Because no servant is greater than their master. So just prior to those verses we read in Luke 12, we'll go back a few verses to verse 35. Jesus said this, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. That's the instructions that He gave to those who had ears that would listen and do what He said to do. So Peter asked in verse 41, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answers, Who then is the faithful and wise manager? Who? Out of the world. Who? Can you put your name in there? Whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant from whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, here's the promise on top of that, and then you'll see the promises all throughout Scripture. If you do this, you will also get this, because your Father loves to give good gifts to His children, so much more than you like to give good gifts to your children if you're a good parent. And if you know, you give your child the world. So what does God your Father in heaven want to give you for all eternity? Truly I tell you, He will put him in charge of all his possessions. So you don't have to worry about that but suppose that follows if that's you. You're not but suppose that servant who says to himself, my master's taking a long time coming, so I'm going to do other than what Jesus Christ died for and called me to do so that I would continue his works of righteousness on this earth that I would give that safety message to everyone that I encounter that will save their life for all eternity. Did I pay attention to the flight attendant's safety message? No. Should I? Yeah. Because we don't know what will happen. And I've been given a responsibility and rewarded for that that if tragedy does occur, which we know tragedy will occur, We know that anybody who does not know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior will spend all eternity apart from God. We don't even need to describe the place. They're just going to spend eternity apart from God who wants to be their Father so much that He would send His only Son to die for them. That should be motivation enough. That's what Paul starts out 1 Corinthians with. And he could have stopped right there writing the whole letter if they would have just said, What? You're right. What are we doing? Why are we fussing? Why are we arguing? Why do we care who's teaching us what? All that matters is Jesus Christ, Him crucified. And we've got to take up our cross and follow after Him and spread the gospel message, this message of foolishness because the the ones that find it foolish are the ones that are perishing. But the ones who find this message wise, who have accepted it, it is the power of God saving their very souls. And that's what we're supposed to proclaim. Jesus came to give sight to the blind, to give restore hearing back to the death, to the deaf. Jesus healed me of my spiritual blindness and my spiritual deafness. And if you're a believer, He healed you. Why? So that you could present the light to the world, that you could be that lamp burning brightly to bring glory and honor to Him. Early in chapter 12 of Luke, Jesus spoke these words to me many times when I've read it. And every time I read it, I get it differently. And starting in verse 16 of Luke 12, And He told Alan this parable, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? 
I have no place to store all my crops. I have all this leg room. I have this freedom. I have all of these things that's given in Christ. I live in the richest nation on earth, and I am not persecuted for my faith. <laughs> not in the least. What do I do with all of these riches? <clears throat> then he said, this is what, I, I sh what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Wow. Isn't that what I do all the time? That's why I read it. He told Alan this parable. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I shall say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take, take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Don't pay any attention to that safety message. You're fine. You have all the leg room. It's going to be a comfortable flight for you. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. What greater thing could Jesus give you than salvation and then the power of God to live out this life which will bring you joy and peace in all circumstances until He calls you home? What greater riches could you have? We are so rich and so blessed by God through Jesus. So are we living wisely and richly towards God? I mentioned in 1 Corinthians that Paul calls us servants. That he says we all have a responsibility. So that brings me to this morning's scripture. We've got a scripture where some listened and some didn't. Some built wisely and some did not. And we see what happened. The difference in the homes and whether they stood or not was not whether they believed. It was whether they put into practice their belief. Because that's what showed their belief. This is part of Jesus' teaching where Luke recorded as the Sermon on the Plain. It is close to the Sermon on the Mount. You might think it's the same. You might not think it's the same. I don't think it's the same story. Okay? There are some similarities. There are some differences. But remember that Luke writes the way he writes, not in chronological order, but he's writing an orderly account to those who have said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to learn more about this Jesus. I want to forsake this world and leave it all behind and follow after the Master to take on His teachings. I want to know with certainty what I have been taught and say that I believe so that I can tell others, so that I can live a life of worth. So let's go back to Luke 1 before we go to our scripture from this morning. In Luke 1 verse 1 it says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. That, G that Scripture prophesied about and Jesus fulfilled. And we can see it, and we see it every day even more in archaeology and, and other things, and fulfilled Scripture that still goes on today. Israel being a nation again. Who would have ever thought? And it's in our lifetime. Who would think that Jesus is going to come back? But it might be in our lifetime. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses of these events. And what? Servants of the Word. They took seriously what Jesus told them. They realized that their life was not their own. They realized that they were saved by grace. And they had a calling. They were called out to be a light to this world. To be Jesus' hands and feet. Verse 3, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully invested, investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. Now we don't know who Theopolis is. We don't know that from history. We don't know it from Luke's writing. But what I challenge you here is to put in your name again. Because you are most excellent. You are most valued. You are most high if you believe in Jesus Christ, because you are a son or a daughter of God. 
so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This was the gospel message of Jesus intended for those who say that they believe to strengthen and secure their faith so that they could carry out the task ahead of them. That's why Luke continues his writing in Acts and talks about when the power of God comes upon them at Pentecost and says, you will be my witnesses. This is the continuation of my works through you by the power of God, not by your power of might, but because of a mighty God who loves you and equips you and who will never, ever forsake you. And Luke, if you don't know it, records even more words than Paul in those two, two works of his. <clears throat> so are you searching? Are you already a disciple? And will you carry out the task that's been set before you? Don't miss this point. Otherwise, everything the airline stewardess, me, steward, let's clarify that. Everything the airline steward has given you in this safety message. You don't want to be that deaf crowd that has ears but don't listen. If you believe that Jesus is who He says He is, then first of all you decide to become His disciple. And then with that power given to you, you decide to live and preach the kingdom of God to the world around you because it is the power of salvation. No other name given among heaven, given to men, whereby we may be saved. And at the knee of Jesus, every, at the, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and everyone will confess that He is Lord. Shouldn't we be giving the safety message now? So in Luke 6, 46 through 49, this is the conclusion to the Sermon on the Plain. P-L-A-I-N, not P-L-A-N-E. See, isn't that funny? Because I was talking about a plain, but we're also talking about plain because Jesus had come down off the mountainside. Okay, got it? Yeah. This is his conclusion, and it is very similar to Matthew's. But remember, he has wrote this to give you an orderly account, not necessarily chronologically or anything. And he comes to the end of those teachings, and Jesus says this, recorded by Luke. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Why do you do that? Do you want to deceive yourself? I should be Lord of your life. Why are you calling me this? Not just Lord, but Lord, Lord. And you don't do what I say. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They are like a man building a house who dug deep and laid that foundation, that 1 Corinthians foundation, on Jesus Christ and nothing else. That firm foundation. <clears throat> they laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods came, and you've experienced probably many of them in your lives, the torrent, the terrible waves, storm, winds, whatever they are, when we were in Hawaii, we were, we were on Maui and Oahu, the two safe islands. <laughs> the island below us was erupting and the island above us was flooding away. Now, I don't know, <laughs> but Sherry and I had a firm foundation and I thought about that like I said. What about all the other people that don't in this world? That don't know when the eruption's going to happen or the flood's going to come or even the engine's going to blow and take out a window in the plane. We see tragedies in our life all the time. We heard about one this morning where the woman fell in the well. Did we, when we had the opportunity, tell them about Jesus? About the hope that we have? The joy and the peace that we have? When the torrent struck that house, it could not shake it. Why? Why? Because it was well 
built. It had a secure foundation. But, complete opposite, and there are only two types again, not three or four or five, two. But, the one who hears my word, same, same thing, uh, let's see. As for everyone comes to me and hears my words, is verse 47. The one who hears my words, verse 49. But here's the difference. And does not put them into practice. That little knot in there. It's like a man who built a house, because you're still building whether you think you are. You're storing up treasures in heaven. No, yeah, heaven. Or on earth. Where are you building those treasures up? Because you can't serve both God and the devil or money or things, however you want to put it. You serve one or the other. You're building one house or the other. That when destruction comes, we'll be destroyed or we'll stand firm. There's your two options. The one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like this. A man who built a house on grand, ground without a foundation. And your bulletin shows you some examples of that. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed. And not only that, and its destruction was complete. There was no hope, nothing else. There's no second chances for a do-over in this life. You have one life. And if you truly believe, you're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ to be a servant of all. Because why should you be any greater than your Master who gave up His throne in heaven to come and die for you? To teach you all of these words, not part of them, but all of them. And to equip you with the power so that you could live that life. So Jesus is crying out and saying, Why do you call me, Lord, Lord? Are you building your foundation firmly? Or do you say you believe, but your actions show something different? Please listen up while you still have time. While you have time to truly believe. And that's all it takes to truly believe. That's, that's all I have to do is put my faith and hope in Jesus Christ. And nothing else. Are you His disciple? Because many proclaim that they are His disciples. Many say, but Lord, Lord, we did my, many mighty works in Your name. Even cast out demons. But he has to say to those who don't believe, I begged you. I pleaded with you. I wrote it down. I died for it. Don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers. There are two types of individuals, two types of home. <laughs> only one foundation, Jesus Christ. And whether your life is built on that or not. What kind of home are you building for all eternity? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you've done. I thank you for each one that's here. I thank you for this family that you have brought together by the power of your Spirit. May we spur one another, as Scripture say, to meet together regularly, to prepare ourselves to live out this new life, this new hope that you've given us in Jesus Christ. That we gladly cannot contain ourselves that we don't want the rocks to cry out, that we want to cry out for you instead and say, listen up. This world needs Jesus. Let me tell you about Him. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the Spirit that ties us together. I thank you that we have a home, a secure foundation in Jesus Christ. We just praise your name today, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.